Welcome to the Motherboard Review Hour. I'll be your host, Spuds McGee. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. No, really. Seriously, today we're going to take a look at the MSI Z170A Gaming M9, as if you didn't know that from looking at the title. Now, this board is a premium board, and when I got it, it was like, why is this premium exactly? It's like, okay, I can see that the voltage delivery system is designed for, you know, a custom loop water cooler, but what else is there? So I started digging into the rest of the board, and then I noticed, holy crap, the audio delivery system on this motherboard is not like anything that I have seen before. This is crazy. So the audio circuit on this motherboard is the first thing that caught my eye, and without even really, I mean, yeah, the, the marketing material, the, uh, the, the advertising on the box says, uh, you know, this is the Extreme Audio DAC in Nehemic Audio. So the Extreme Audio DAC powered by Nehemic delivers breathtaking sound quality and high quality components using a Sabre Hi-Fi DAC. This dedicated onboard sound card is powered by a C-Media 6632A and delivers 120 dB at 384 kHz, 32-bit. Okay, so I'm not an audiophile. Those things don't really mean anything to me. I can't actually, you know, hook it up to anything and figure it out. But I can hook it up to an oscilloscope and do stuff with the oscilloscope and say, hmm, okay, it does this, and hmm, okay, it does that. I don't know that that's really necessary in this case, although if enough of people ask for it, maybe I'll actually do that. But it is worth taking a look at the componentry involved. And so the, the particular component here is the C-Media 6632A. Now this is interesting because this typically shows up on a USB DAC. This is actually a USB codec. And so they've implemented the sound solution here, I think with a USB sort of audio controller. But not only that, they've implemented a whole host of digital to analog converters and analog to digital converters. Uh, they've implemented it for both the front panel connectors and the rear I.O. connectors, both. And so when you look at the circuit on this and you look at the premium audio capacitors and you look at the Nehemic implementation, it's like, holy crap, there's a lot here. This is basically an entire sound card shoved onto a motherboard. A significant amount of, of motherboard real estate is actually dedicated to the sound card. Now the DACs are not user replaceable or anything like that, but there are a bunch of them. All in all, there are nine Texas Instruments OPA 1652 op amps that are on this motherboard. So user replaceable is kind of out the window when you're dealing with that. There are also two National Instruments LM4562 Hi-Fi dual audio amplifiers that are sort of in the mix. Now these Texas Instruments uh, panels are some of our favorite operational amplifiers for USB DACs. We were actually looking at some USB DACs and some custom audio solutions, and typically they were based on versions or variations of the reference uh, audio circuits from Texas Instruments. So what I can tell you with my untrained ear using a good pair of Sony sort of studio monitor headphones, the onboard audio is very good. The onboard microphone capture and things like that is better than I mean to my ear is better than anything that I've uh, dealt with recently again I'm not an audio file and it's very subjective but the components in here are pretty good components for the kind of thing that you would do and in terms of like the bill of materials cost for this particular motherboard that is where the cost has gone that is where they have invested the most money in this particular implementation the rest of the board it's got the killer nick that's wired it also has the killer nick that's a two by two a wireless configuration that means on 802.11 ac it's limited to about 867 megabit give or take however if you're using both wired and wireless then the killer software can actually use both connections at the same time although it's hard for me to imagine anybody saturating their gigabit connection unless they're also using their computer as like a media server for the rest of the house and then somebody decides to download your entire movie collection while you're playing a game or something like that then maybe most of the time the limiting factor is going to be your internet connection but you would want to prioritize game traffic and tcp and udp over other stuff on your on your network card just to shave whatever milliseconds you can off of that packet delivery now this motherboard does feature two m.2 slots both m.2 slots are available as a pci express by four configuration or sata there are some resources for those slots that are shared with other resources on the motherboard so you'll have to refer to the manual to know which sata ports and which pci express slots share connectivity with the m.2 slots there is a a, a huge number of uh, PCI Express Gen 3 switches on the motherboard to switch which lanes are going where. And interestingly on this motherboard layout, the top slot and the bottom by 16 slot are your 2x8x8 slots if you're going to run SLI. You're not going to run 
basically it's the metal clad slots. So the metal clad slots on this motherboard are the ones that are designed for running GPUs. Those are the ones that are connected directly to the CPU. The other PCI Express slots are connected through the DMI 3.0 interface. Now the total amount of bandwidth for DMI 3.0 between all the peripherals of the system and the CPU is about equal to four PCI Express Gen 3 lanes or about 32 gigabits per second or about four gigabytes per second. And so depending on what you're running, you know, the top slot or the very first slot is gonna be your only by 16 slot for your graphics card. If you're running two graphics cards for SLI, you'll want to use both of the armored PCI Express slots. If you're running Crossfire, then you can use the middle slot, but you know that's going to be running at a by four configuration. Because both M.2 slots can run at SATA or PCI Express, if you're going to run them at PCI Express, for example, you'll really want to look at the manual to determine which PCI Express slots will be disabled if you're running with the M.2, depending on which M.2 slot you're actually running in. Now, one other thing that MSI has done to make uh, overclockers lives a little easier this time around is they have a physical mechanical knob on the corner of the motherboard that has presets for a bunch of CPUs for the i5s and the i7. And depending on how extreme you want to overclock, you basically just crank the knob up. And the knob does go up to 11, so I think we've got some Spinal Tap fans in the MSI engineering team. <laughs> Kudos, guys. Good job. <laughs> it goes up, but this one goes up to 11. <laughs> Oh Lord. So yeah, 11, I, I don't have any CPUs that will hit 11. At 11, you're, you're pushing five gigahertz. But I do have a CPU that'll hit 4.7, no problem, and 4.8 on two cores. And I was actually able to use the little knob thingy to get there. Now for mine at, at 4.7, uh, it's going to be running at 1.3 volts, and I think that my particular CPU needs just a little bit more voltage than that to get perfect stability, like maybe 1.32, um, upwards of 1.35. You don't be running more than 1.42, even on good uh, all-in-one liquid air cooling with this generation of CPU, so something to keep in mind. But, you know, with the, you know, turning it up for me, a six is what I could get out of my CPU. And it did actually work. I did set it to six and I had a CPU that I knew would work at that configuration. Basically, everything was okay. The rule is update your UEFI. I got early versions of, of the Skylake boards from a whole bunch of different people that were like, here, test it, see if it works. So I did the testing and pretty much everybody across the board needs UEFI updates. That's not anything bad, it's just because Skylake is new, so, you know, getting the memory to run at faster than 2133 and be stable, and getting, you know, all four memory sticks to run at faster than 2133 and be stable, and getting the CPUs to overclock much past, you know, 4.4 gigahertz and be stable. Those are things that have taken some time to get right, and so no exception here. But with the latest version of UEFI, 4.7, DDR4, 3000 stable, no problem. So even keeping an eye on the power delivery system when we were doing those extreme, you know, 4.7 gigahertz overclocks was basically okay. Sometimes with the uh, custom loop ready cooling, they don't do as good of a job, uh, you know, as an evaporative cooler or something like that, that is not necessarily designed for a custom loop cooler. But I'm happy to report that the particular cooler in this case on this MSI motherboard, even though it is designed for custom loop cooling, is basically ready to go. And I have a feeling that that's probably because they overbuilt the power delivery system on this particular motherboard, just in case somebody is not going to use some sort of crazy extreme overclocking. But this motherboard does have the liquid nitrogen options if you are an extreme crazy person. This motherboard also has two USB 3.1 10 gigabit per second ports. That's one type A and one reversible type C. That's provided by an Asmedia controller and the Asmedia controller is connected with PCI Express through the DMI interface. Also included in the box, is this MSI CPU installation tool. Now this is a little piece of plastic that's designed to snap on your CPU and make it easier to correctly insert the CPU into the socket. If, if you just drop the CPU in the socket, you're gonna probably damage the pins in the socket and that's basically an irreparable situation. Not covered by warranty because it was your screw up. So you have to be careful with that. With the CPU installation tool, you can snap the CPU into this little piece of plastic and have a, a slightly better grip on the CPU as you sort of pilot it into position in the CPU socket. And then this little tool actually stays in the socket uh, even after you close the lid on the socket and it just sort of stays out of the way. So this is something that will maybe if you're nervous about installing your CPU, you can use this to help you get your CPU in the socket without, you know, screwing it up. I would have liked to have seen another wired NIC, especially at this price point. I don't think it really would have added too much to the bill of materials cost. At this price point, I really would have liked to have seen an Intel NIC, 
but my own bias is that I see Intel NICs and I use Intel NICs in the, on the business side and in the enterprise computing side of things and uh, not really so much on the, on the killer NIC side of things. That said, I have been impressed by what killer does in terms of like doing benchmarks with it and stacking it up, you know, side by side with like one of the consumer grade Intel NICs. The killer NICs, they hold their own. Uh, most of the magic from the killer side of things comes from the software stack and how it prioritizes uh, TCP acknowledgement packets, which those will help give an overall uh, network performance boost and the way that it sort of deprioritizes bulk traffic in favor of trying to keep latency low. It's an interesting approach. It works at this price point. I would have liked to have seen an Intel NIC, but it does have the killer two by two interface. A three by three might've been nice, but 800 megabit, your internet connection is not that fast anyway. That's probably all right. Also included with this motherboard is XSplit Gamecaster version two. This is a premium one year subscription. So if you're into XSplit, there you go. Although I would like to see a motherboard manufacturer or a group of motherboard manufacturers go to the OBS guy, the guy that does Open Broadcaster, and say, hey, we want to sponsor development for like a year instead of buying licenses for, you know, XSplit. That would be neat if that happened. I suspect if the OBS guy made it easy for companies to do that and then say sponsored by MSI, that they would probably do that. And that would probably be better for the gaming community at large because OBS, especially OBS multi-platform, has really gotten a lot of features in really short order. XSplit still does some things that Open Broadcaster does not, but I think in terms of stability, Open Broadcaster is head and shoulders above XSplit. But that's my own personal opinion. It doesn't really have anything to do with the motherboard. This motherboard also has an XMP status LED to show you that the XMP profile is working correctly. Two interesting things that MSI did with USB 3.0 ports that are on this motherboard. This motherboard has two USB 3.0 front panel headers, one at a right angle, one straight through. The straight through has extra power delivery options. Uh, the extra power delivery options, if you install the MSI utility software, it'll actually disable the data pins, I think, and just dump voltage on there so that it's part of the USB charging specification. So you can use those ports to actually rapid charge your phone. The other thing that this motherboard implements is um, some Asmedia redrivers, is what they're called. These Asmedia chips will actually um, retransmit the USB signal at a higher level in order to deal with um, sketchy or long USB 3 cables on your case. So if you've had a case where you've had USB 3 front panel devices and you plug in a hard drive and the hard drive won't work on the front panel connector or a USB 3 flash drive will not work on the front panel connector but works fine on the back panel connector, the read drivers will help alleviate that problem because of the length of the USB 3 cable from the front panel connector in your case to where the USB cables are, or if the USB 3 front panel circuit board in your case is a little sketchy, the redrivers will help deal with that. I thought that was neat that we're starting to see that because that's been a problem that I've run into on cases, especially you know after you've had a machine in a case for a few months and you've had something that you know like a USB hard drive or something like that, and it's like, well, this was working and now it doesn't work, but it still works through the the back panel USB 3. What's going on there? And it's like, well, probably drawing slightly more power than the engineers intended through those front panel USB connectors. So the redrivers will help with that in terms of a signal quality, not as much with power delivery, but in terms of signal, you're okay. So overall, what's the verdict? Well, this is a premium motherboard at a premium price point. Most of the premium on this motherboard is going to the audio circuitry. It does have an armored backplate. The armored backplate is a significant you know, force to be reckoned with. It does have armored PCI Express slots. So in terms of like a LAN machine and a LAN machine that you lug around with really heavy graphics cards, this will help with that. The PCI Express slots are also shielded, which may cut down on electromagnetic interference. Um, I'm running some tests under Linux right now uh, and the PCI Express hardware error correction. You actually do see some uh, electromagnetic noise with PCI Express Gen 3 that is sort of corrected on the fly. So that's, but that's a whole other topic for a whole other, a whole other day. It remains to be seen exactly how much the shielding is gonna help for day-to-day -day computing. In terms of build quality and engineering, no complaints with the build quality, no complaints with the, with the engineering. With the updated UEFI, the problems that I was having with this motherboard are basically all solved. It's now pretty solid. Now on to the testing and overclocking. I know that this CPU is stable at 4.7, um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and click this. Uh, it's got a physical hardware mode or software mode. We do the little help here. It says, oh, you know, this is the settings that correspond to the various speeds. We got the i7 in there, 4.69. 
So it's going to do set six. So let's set it to that. Let's check on memory. Memory did indeed overclock to three gigahertz from 2133. And as for the CPU side of things, we're going to tell it the game boost software mode, mode six, F10, save and exit. Let's see if we post. Hey, look at that. 4.69 gigahertz. Oh, interesting. This is actually doing it with a multiplier of 46, but a CPU base clock of 102. I'll have to test this for further stability, but that's an interesting note. One cool thing with this motherboard is the keyboard shortcut thing. So there's a particular USB port on the back. If you plug your keyboard in there, you can actually hit a shortcut on your keyboard and jump directly to the UEFI. So with this particular feature, you can power on the system. So you could hit, for example, uh, control backspace or print screen F12 to turn the machine on. You can increase or decrease the base clock with these keyboard shortcuts. Print screen F4 will take you to the update BIOS screen. Print screen F9 will reset the computer. Print screen F5 and F6 will toggle the CPU uh, multiplier. So you can do that from the keyboard from the, the bot thing. And then print screen F8 will toggle slow mode. Now slow mode is something that's also provided on this motherboard via a mechanical switch on the uh, bottom edge of the motherboard. This is really for liquid nitrogen overclocking so that the system will boot up with a very low clock frequency so that it won't crash or do anything weird uh, when you're booting up with extreme, extreme crazy liquid nitrogen overclocking. The hotkey function can be disabled via a mechanical switch on the motherboard as well in case that's not your thing. If you got one of these or you're thinking about getting one of these, head on over to the forums at techsyndicate.com. I'm Wendell, I'm signing out, and I'll see you there. <laughs>